Welcome to Process Control Design and Practice. My name is Tom Meadowcroft. In this video, we will learn about sequencing states and batch recipes. We've spent most of the previous videos talking about continuous processes, continuous feedback controls, and continuous degrees of freedom, but many of the processes in the process industries are batch processes. Processes where the material changes in time in one unit rather than in space as it moves from unit to unit in a continuous process. A batch moves through a sequence of states. To control a batch, we need to focus on describing sequences, algorithms and procedures, on sequential logic. Let's start looking at sequences by looking at a recipe, how to boil an egg. To boil an egg, we must put the eggs in a cooking pot, cover with water, heat to boiling, turn off the heat and let sit for 12 minutes, then transfer the eggs to ice water until they are cool to the touch. To describe this in sequential logic, we need to break this down into three elements. Actions, which are things we do, transitions, which are conditions we wait for until they're true, and decisions where we make a choice between two or more mutually exclusive options. Back to egg boiling. We can take our recipe and break it up into a series of actions, each starting with a verb, broken up by transitions where we either are waiting for the action to complete or for some other trigger to be true. So we put the eggs in the pot, then turn on the water. The first transition is simply waiting for the action to complete but the second one is waiting for the thermodynamic state to change, waiting for a level to reach a threshold. Once we start heating, the next threshold is waiting for a temperature. And then we're waiting for time to pass. Then we cool and wait for two minutes, at which point we have a decision. If the eggs are cool, proceed. Otherwise, go back for more cooling. In breaking down this egg recipe, we see most of what we need to describe sequential logic, whether in a procedure or in an algorithm executed by a computer. As a communication and design aid, we're going to learn to visually describe sequential logic in flowchart form as a sequential function chart. Actions will go into rectangles. Everything in one rectangle is executed simultaneously. We'll connect the action rectangles with lines and arrows, and after every action block, there must be a transition, indicated by a horizontal line, where we'll write the logical expression, which must be true to proceed. So we continue to execute the extra actions in the action block until the transition that follows it becomes true. Let's see how our egg recipe looks as a sequential function chart. The actions are now in boxes and the transitions on lines separating the boxes. Each transition is true or false at any moment in time. We continue adding water until the expression water covers eggs is true. When we get to our decision point, we represent that as a branch with two or more transitions. The rule with a decision is that one and only one branch must be true. They must be mutually exclusive, so we always have one path to proceed down, but never more than one. There's one more element we need to be able to describe any procedure or algorithm, and that is parallel actions. At times, we wish to execute more than one sequence simultaneously, like raising the temperature while lowering the pressure and adding a liquid to a vessel all at once. Let's add a salt addition to our egg boiling recipe that occurs in parallel to the heat up. A double horizontal line indicates the beginning and end of parallel sequences. At the end of the parallel sequences, they must come together at another double line and all of the final transitions in the parallel branches must be true before the sequence can proceed. So water boiling 
and salt addition complete both need to be true in this case. Let's return to an example from the states chapter. A plus B reacts to C when heated. We boil or strip off the unreacted A and B under vacuum, then discharge the purified C. The unreacted A and B condensate stripped off into the receiver is added to the next batch. If we write out the recipe, it looks like this. We're going to write a sequential function chart for this recipe, but for actions, I'm going to limit us to the elements of this list. Charge A, which charges A to the reactor, charge B, charge receiver, which em empties the receiver into the reactor, reactor temperature, which controls the temperature, reactor pressure, same, weight, sample, and discharge. In each case, the target parameter is the quantity we want achieved, kilograms for the charge steps, degrees for temperature, millimeters of mercury for pressure, and minutes for weight. Each of this limited vocabulary of actions is actually a sequence of actions that we're going to call a phase. So charge A represents a sequence that charges a target amount of raw material A to the reaction. And Rx press gives a new target pressure to the reactor's pressure sequence, which executes steps to reach that new pressure. We'll learn how to write these phase sequences in a later lecture, but for now, just assume they exist. Pause here and try to write the SFC for this recipe yourself. The recipe starts with our three charges. They can happen simultaneously, so we can write them as parallel actions with double lines above and below. We wait until all three are complete. Reactor temp gives the reactor a new temperature target, and then we wait for that target to be achieved. The wait step is self-explanatory. To strip the unreacted A and B, we need to heat and pull vacuum simultaneously, so these are again in parallel. We wait for both to be achieved. That's how we know thermodynamically the strip, the boil off, is finished. Then we break back to atmospheric pressure and sample. At this point, we have a decision. So the batch branches to two mutually exclusive transitions based on the sample lab results. The bad sample path leads back up to where we stripped to repeat that step. The good sample path executes the discharge phase to empty the reactor. Today we've learned how batch processes require us to sequence states. We learned how to describe sequential logic in terms of actions, transitions, and decisions. We learned to draw each on a sequential function chart and then added parallel operations to allow us to diagram any sequence. Look for the next lectures on modular batch design and on recipes and phases to expand on what we've started here. Those videos, together with text and exercises to practice, can be found at chemicalengineeringpractice.org. I'm Tom Meadowcroft. I hope to see you again soon.